Welcome to part four of the Comprachicos by Ayn Rand. Let's see what we can learn today, about today, from her essay written in 1970. Today we cover college. Most young people retain some hold on their rational faculty, or at least some unidentified desire to retain it, until their early 20s, approximately until their post-college years. The symptom of that desire is their quest for a comprehensive view of life. It is man's rational faculty that integrates his cognitive material and enables him to understand it. His only means of understanding is conceptual. A consciousness, like any other vital faculty, cannot accept its own impotence without protest. No matter how badly disorganized, a young person's mind still gropes for answers to fundamental questions, sensing that all of its content hangs precariously in a vacuum. Did you ever feel like that when you got out of high school? You're like, okay, this is all supposed to come together in some kind of whole, right? Like, I mean, it's all supposed to make sense. I'm supposed to understand life better now than I did before, right? Or all these just snippets of information just kind of hanging there or serving the purpose of getting me into college. At least that's how I felt. This is not a matter of idealism, but of psychoepistemological necessity. On the conscious level, the countless alternatives confronting him make a young person aware of the fact he has to make choices and that he does not know what to choose or how to act. On the subconscious level, his psychoepistemology has not yet automatized a lethargic resignation to a state of chronic suffering which is the solution of most adults. And the painful conflicts of his inner contradictions, of his self-doubt, of his impotent confusion, make him search frantically for some form of inner unity and mental order. His quest represents the last convulsions of his cognitive faculty at the approach of atrophy, like a last cry of protest. So as a student is getting ready to head off to college or head into their own individual adult life right after college, they're thinking like, all right, it's... I, you know, I haven't yet given up on just complacency and apathy and all right, here's my life. I get up, I go to work. Is this a life of quiet desperation, right? No, they haven't given up yet. They're still hoping that the heavens are going to open and everything's going to make sense and somewhere, somehow, they're going to find that key, the missing piece to make it all hang together. For the few brief years of his adolescence, a young person's future is urgently, though dimly, real to him. He senses that he has to determine it in some unknown way. A thinking youth has a vague glimmer of the nature of his need. It is expressed in his concern with broad philosophical questions, particularly with moral issues, i.e. with a code of values to guide his actions. An average youth merely feels helpless, and his erratic restlessness is a form of escape from the desperate feeling that things ought to make sense. By the time they're ready for college, both types of youths have been hurt in and out of school by countless clashes with the irrationality of their elders and of today's culture. The thinking youth has been frustrated and is longing to find people who take ideas seriously, but he believes that he will find them in college, in the alleged citadel of reason and wisdom. The average youth feels that things do not make sense to him, but they do to someone somewhere in the world, and someone will make the world intelligible to him someday. And both of these youths arrive at college. The one saying, I'm going to find people who think deeply and will help me better understand everything because we will have deep philosophical conversations. And the other one says, somebody here knows what I should be thinking, doing, choosing, and they'll point me in the right direction. For both of them, college is the last hope. They lose it in their freshman year. It is generally known in academic circles that according to surveys, the student's interest in their studies is greatest in their freshman year and diminishes progressively each year thereafter. The educators deplore it, but do not question the nature of the courses they are giving. With rare exceptions which are lost in the academic mainstream, college courses in the humanities do not provide the students with knowledge, but with the conviction that it is wrong, naive, or futile to seek knowledge. What they provide is not information, but rationalization. The rationalization of the student's concrete, bound, perceptual, emotion-oriented method of mental functioning. The courses are designed to protect the status quo. Not the existential, political, or social status quo, but the miserable status quo of the student's psychoepistemology as laid down in the progressive nursery school. In other words... We're not going to help you make sense. We're going to do the opposite. We're going to further degrade your sense-making ability. 
The progressive nurseries pleaded for a delay of the process of education, asserting that cognitive training is premature for a young child and conditioned his mind to an anti-cognitive method of functioning. The grade in high schools reinforced the conditioning. Struggling helplessly with random snatches of knowledge, the student learned to associate a sense of dread, resentment, and self-doubt with the process of learning. College completes the job, declaring explicitly to a receptive audience that there is nothing to learn. The reality is unknowable, certainty is unattainable, the mind is an instrument of self-deception, and the sole function of reason is to find conclusive proof of its own impotence. Does that sound familiar? Sounds a lot like critical theory to me. Even though philosophy is held in a, today, well-earned contempt by the other college departments, it is philosophy that determines the nature and direction of all the other courses, because it is philosophy that formulates the principles of epistemology, i.e. the rules by which men are to acquire knowledge. The influence of the dominant philosophic theories permeates every other department, including the physical sciences, and becomes the more dangerous because accepted unconsciously. The philosophic theories of the past 200 years since Immanuel Kant seem to justify the attitude of those who dismiss philosophy as empty, inconsequential verbiage. But this precisely is the danger. Surrendering philosophy, i.e. the foundations of knowledge, to the purveyors of empty verbiage is far from inconsequential. It is particularly to philosophy that one must apply the advice of Ellsworth Tui in The Fountainhead. Don't bother to examine folly. Ask yourself only what it accomplishes. Ugh. Consider the progressive stages of modern philosophy, not from the aspect of its philosophic content, but of its psycho-epistemological goals. When pragmatism declares that reality is an indeterminate flux, which can be anything people want it to be, nobody accepts it literally. But it strikes a note of emotional recognition in the mind of a progressive nursery graduate, because it seems to justify a feeling that he has not been able to explain. The omnipotence of the pack. So he accepts it as true in some indeterminate way, to be used when and as needed. When pragmatism declares that truth is to be judged by consequences, it justifies his inability to project the future, to plan his course of action long range, and sanctions his wish to act on the spur of the moment, to try anything once, and then discover whether he can get away with it or not. When logical positivism declares that reality, identity, existence, mind are meaningless terms that man can be certain of nothing but the sensory perceptions of the immediate moment, when it declares that the meaning of the proposition Napoleon lost the Battle of Waterloo is your walk to the library where you read it in a book, the progressive nursery graduate recognizes it as an exact description of his inner state and as a justification of his concrete-bound perceptual mentality. When linguistic analysis declares that the ultimate reality is not even percepts but words, and the words have no specific reference but mean whatever people want them to mean, the progressive graduate finds himself happily back at home in the familiar world of his nursery school. He does not have to struggle to grasp an incomprehensible reality. All he has to do is focus on people and watch for the vibrations of how they use words and compete with his fellow philosophers in how many different vibrations he's able to discover. And more, armed with the prestige of philosophy, he can now tell people what they mean when they speak, which they're unable to know without his assistance. I.e., he can appoint himself interpreter of the will of the pack. What had once been a little manipulator now grows to the full psycho-epistemological stature of a shyster lawyer. Does this sound familiar? Armed with the prestige of philosophy, he can now tell people what they mean when they speak, which they're unable to know without his assistance. That's just your fragility talking. You don't really know what you think or what you feel. You need me. I'm the expert. I need to decode it for you. And more. Linguistic analysis is vehemently opposed to all the intellectual feats he is unable to perform. It is opposed to any kinds of principles or broad generalizations, i.e. to consistency. It is opposed to basic axioms as analytic and redundant, i.e. to the necessity of any grounds for one's assertions. It is opposed to the hierarchical structure of concepts, i.e. to the process of abstraction, and regards any word as an isolated primary, i.e. as a perceptually given concrete. It is opposed to system building, i.e. to the integration of knowledge. And in this paragraph, we have the entire reason critical theory even makes sense to anyone. It doesn't make any sense to me, but the reason it makes sense to these people who use it is that all of this has been taught. There's no need, there's no necessity for grounds for one's assertions. I just need to assert them. And if I use the right words, I don't, I don't need a hierarchy of, or a structure of concepts. I just need to use the right words. I need to imbue them with the right meaning. And then I need to tell people that I'm the expert who can imbue them with meaning and you can't take them apart and understand them because there's no integration of knowledge there. 
The progressive nursery graduate thus finds all his psychopistemological flaws transformed into virtues. Sound familiar? And instead of hiding them as a guilty secret, he can flaunt them as proof of his intellectual superiority. As to the students who did not attend a progressive nursery, they are now worked over to make them equal his mental status. It is, or they're canceled. <laughs> it is the claim of linguistic analysis that its purpose is not the communication of any particular philosophic content, but the training of a student's mind. This is true in the terrible butchering sense of a Comprachico operation. The detailed discussions of inconsequential minutia, the discourses on trivia picked at random and in midstream without base, context, or conclusion, the shocks of self-doubt at the professor's sudden revelations of some such fact as the student's inability to define the word but, which he claims proves that they do not understand their own statements, the countering of the question, what is the meaning of philosophy with, which sense of meaning do you mean? Followed by a discourse on 12 possible uses of the word meaning, by which time the question is lost and above all the necessity to shrink one's focus to the range of a fleas and to keep it there will cripple the best of minds if it attempts to comply. Mind training pertains to psychopistemology. It consists in making a mind automatize certain processes, turning them into permanent habits. What habits does linguistic analysis inculcate? Context dropping, concept stealing, disintegration, purposelessness, the inability to grasp, retain, or deal with abstractions. Linguistic analysis is not a philosophy. It is a method of eliminating the capacity for philosophical thought. It is a course in brain destruction, a systematic attempt to turn a rational animal into an animal unable to reason. So the last time you had a conversation with someone who was woke, and they fixated obsessively on some word or, you know, just that you used a word. Context be damned. It doesn't matter what your intent was. Only the outcome, only the impact matters. The impact, someone's feelings were hurt, but they dropped all context. That's not how I meant it. You need to understand it in context. No, I don't. Did you get the feeling these people weren't thinking? That they were actively avoiding thinking? That thinking, in fact, was some kind of disease? This is why. Why? What is the Comprachico's motive? To paraphrase Victor Hugo, and what did they make of these children? Monsters. Why monsters? To rule. Man's mind is his basic means of survival and for self-protection. Reason is the most selfish human faculty. It has to be used in and by a man's own mind and its product, truth, makes him inflexible, intransigent, impervious to the power of any pack or any ruler. Deprived of the ability to reason, man becomes a docile, pliant, impotent chunk of clay to be shaped into any subhuman form and used for any purpose by anyone who wants to bother. There has never been a philosophy, a theory, or a doctrine that attacked or limited reason which did not also preach submission to the power of some authority. Philosophically, most men do not understand the issue to this day, but psychopistemologically, they have sensed it since prehistoric times. Observe the nature of mankind's earliest legends, such as the fall of Lucifer, the light bearer, for the sin of de defying authority, or the story of Prometheus, who taught men the practical arts of survival. Power seekers have always known that if men are to be made submissive, the obstacle is not their feelings, their wishes, or their instincts, but their minds. If men are to be ruled, then the enemy is reason. Frederick Douglass knew this. Mm -hmm. Frederick Douglass was told this explicitly by his teacher's husband, so his master, basically, when she tried to teach him to read using the Bible, and he said, reading makes a man unfit to be a slave. So does thinking. Power lust is a psychopistemological matter. It is not confined to potential dictators or aspiring politicians. It can be experienced chronically or sporadically by men in any profession on any level of intellectual development. It is experienced by shriveled scholars, by noisy playboys, by shabby office managers, by pretentious millionaires, by droning teachers, by cocktail-chasing mothers, by anyone who, having uttered an assertion, confronts the direct glance of a man or a child and hears the words, but that is not true. Those who in such moments feel the desire not to persuade, but to force the mind behind the direct eyes are the legions that make the Comprachicos possible. Basically, every school board you come up against. Not all of the modern teachers are consciously motivated by powerless, though a great many of them are. Not all of them are consciously aware of the goal of obliterating reason by crippling the minds of their students. Some aspire to nothing but the mean little pleasure of fooling and defeating too intelligently, persistently inquiring a student. Some seek nothing but to hide and evade the holes and contradictions in their own intellectual equipment. 
Some had never sought anything but a safe, undemanding, respectable position, and would not dream of contradicting the majority of their colleagues or of their textbooks. Some are eaten by envy of the rich, the famous, the successful, the independent. Some believe, or try to believe, the thin veneer of humanitarian rationalizations coding the theories of Kant or John Dewey. And all of them are products of the same educational system in its earlier stages. The system is self-perpetuating. It leads to many vicious circles. The grade and high school teachers blame it on parental influences. The college professors blame it on the grade and high school teachers. Few, if any, question the content of the courses. After struggling for a few years, these better teachers give up and retire or become convinced that reason is beyond the grasp of most men and remain as bitterly indifferent camp followers of the Comprachico's advance. But the Comprachico leaders, past and present, are aware of their own motives. It is impossible to be consumed by a single passion without knowing its nature, no matter what rationalizations one constructs to hide from oneself. If you want to see hatred, do not look at wars or concentration camps. These are merely its consequences. Look at the writings of Kant, Dewey, Marcuse, and their followers to see pure hatred. Hatred of reason and of everything it implies, of intelligence, of ability, of achievement, of success, of self-confidence, of self-esteem, of every bright, happy, benevolent aspect of man. This is the atmosphere, the light motif, the sense of life permeating today's educational establishment. 1970, you guys. 1970. What brings a human being to the state of a Comprachico? Self-loathing. The degree of a man's hatred for reason is the measure of his hatred for himself. A Comprachico leader does not aspire to the role of political dictator. He leaves it to his heir, the mindless brute. The Comprachicos are not concerned with establishing anything. The obliteration of reason is their single passion and goal. What comes afterward has no reality to them. Dimly, they fancy themselves as the masters who will pull the strings behind the ruler's throne. The brute they feel will need them. That they end up as terrorized bootlickers at the brute's court and at his mercy, as in Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia, is merely an instance of reality's justice. Karma. Power lust requires guinea pigs to develop the techniques of inculcating obedience and cannon fodder that will obey the orders. College students fill both roles. Psychoepistemological flattery is the most potent technique to use on a person with a damaged brain. The progressive nursery graduate's last link to rationality, the feeling that there is something wrong with him, is cut off in college. There is nothing wrong with him, he is told. He is the healthy, natural state. He is merely unable to function in a system that ignores human nature. He is normal. The system is abnormal. Systemic. Systemic racism. Systemic whiteness. Got it? The term system is left undefined. At first, it may be the educational system, the cultural system, the private family system, anything that a student might blame for his inner misery. This induces a paranoid mood, the feeling that he is an innocent victim persecuted by some dark, mysterious powers, which builds up in him a blind, helpless rage. The theories of determinism, with which he is battered in most of his courses, intensify and justify his mood. Determinism. Determinism. You're born this race. Your color defines you. Your sexual identity defines you. Your gender defines you. Determinism. Sound familiar? Wow. Wow. If he is miserable, he cannot help it, they tell him. He cannot help anything he feels or does. He's a product of society, and society has made a bad job of it. By the time he hears that all his troubles from poor grades to sexual problems to chronic anxiety are caused by the political system, the social system, whatever system, and that the enemy is capitalism, he accepts it as self-evident. Enemy is capitalism. Sound familiar? The methods of teaching are essentially the same as those used in high school, only more so. The curriculum is an embodiment of disintegration, a hodgepodge of random subjects without continuity, context, or purpose. It is like a series of balkanized kingdoms offering a survey course of floating abstractions or an over-detailed study of a professor's favorite minutia. Women's studies. With the border closed to the kingdom in the next classroom, with no connections, no bridges, no maps, maps, i.e. systematization, are forbidden on principle. Cramming and memorizing are the students' only psychoepistemological means of getting through. There are graduates in philosophy who can recite the differences between the early and late Wittgenstein, but have never had a course on Aristotle. There are graduates in psychology who have puttered about with rats and mazes, with knee-jerking reflexes, and with statistics, but never got to an actual study of human psychology. The discussion seminars are part of the technique of flattery. When an ignorant adolescent is asked to air his views on a subject he has not studied, he gets the message that the status of college student has transformed him from an ignoramus into an authority, and that the significance of any opinion lies in the fact that somebody holds it, with no reasons, knowledge, or grounds necessary. This helps to justify the importance of watching for the vibrations of the pack. Just check out this line. 
The significance of any opinion lies in the fact that somebody holds it. And now attach identity to the somebody. Even better. Such discussions advance another purpose of the Comprachico technique, the breeding of hostility, the encouragement of criticism rather than creativeness. In the absence of any reasoned views, the student develops the knack of blasting each other's nonsense, which is not difficult in the circumstances, and come to regard the demolition of a bad argument as the equivalent of the construction of a good one. The example is set by the professors who, in their own publications and debates, are often brilliant at demolishing one another's irrational theories, but fall flat in attempting to present a new theory of their own. In the absence of intellectual content, the students resort to personal attacks, practicing with impunity the old fallacy of ad hominem, substituting insults for arguments with hooligan rudeness and four-letter words, accepted as part of their freedom of speech. Thus, malice is protected, ideas are not. The unimportance of ideas is further stressed by the demand that the nature of such discussions be ignored and the participants remain good friends, no matter what offensive exchanges took place in the name of intellectual tolerance. If this doesn't sound familiar to you yet, then you probably didn't go to college. (laughs) But for those of us who did at any time from 1970 to the present, this sounds really, really familiar. Unless, of course, you were very fortunate and you went to a school that hadn't yet been invaded by the Comprachicos. I went to school in the Northeast, so I can't say that. An eloquent demonstration of today's general contempt for the power of ideas is offered by the fact that people did not expect an education of this kind to produce any consequences and are now shocked by the spectacle of college students putting into practice what they've been taught. Sound familiar? What happened? Why are they rioting? Why are they burning things down? What in the world has happened to our children? Did you not think there would be consequences to this sort of thing? Or maybe you just weren't paying attention to the fact that it was this sort of thing. If after such training, the students demand the power to run the universities, why shouldn't they? They were given that power intellectually and decided to exercise it existentially. Evergreen, anyone? They were regarded as qualified arbiters of ideas without knowledge, preparation, or experience, and they decided that they were qualified administrators without knowledge, preparation, or experience. The students' demand that their courses be relevant to their actual lives has a badly twisted element of validity. The only purpose of education is to teach a student how to live his life by developing his mind and equipping him to deal with reality. The training he needs is theoretical, i.e. conceptual. He has to be taught to think, to understand, to integrate, to prove. He has to be taught the essentials of the knowledge discovered in the past, and he has to be equipped to acquire further knowledge by his own effort. All of this is what the colleges have renounced, failed in, and defaulted on long ago. What they are teaching today has no relevance to anything, neither to theory, nor practice, nor reality, nor human life. But in keeping with their concrete-bound psychoepistemology, what the students regard as relevant are such things as courses in community action, air pollution, rat control, and guerrilla warfare. Their criteria for determining a college curriculum are the newspaper headlines of the immediate moment. Their hierarchy of concerns is established by tabloid editorials. Their notion of reality does not extend beyond the latest TV talk show. Modern intellectuals used to denounce the influence of comic strips on children. The progress they achieved consists in pushing the children's interest to the front pages and freezing it there for life. The conditioning phase of the Comprachico's task is completed. The student's development is arrested. Their minds are set to respond to slogans as animals respond to a trainer's whistle. Their brains are embalmed in the syrup of altruism as an automatic substitute for self-esteem. They have nothing left but the terror of chronic anxiety, the blind urge to act, to strike out at whoever caused it, and a boiling hostility against the whole of the universe. They would obey anyone. They need a master. They need to be told what to do. They are ready now to be used as cannon fodder, to attack, to bomb, to burn, to murder, to fight in the streets, and die in the gutters. They are a trained pack of miserably impotent freaks, ready to be unleashed against anyone. The Comprachicos unleash them against the system. Gives you chills, doesn't it? Doesn't it give you chills? She wrote it in 1970. Chills, you guys. Like, yeesh. So... If you can get past the repeated use of the term psychoepistemology, which I know a lot of people roll their eyes at because, you know, it's not a term you hear often, it is the term that applies. So get past it and understand this essay. I suggest you read it from beginning to end, even though I've just read it, because, whoa, it was all there. She saw it. She saw what was happening in our schools from nursery school on up. And she was specifically commenting 
on the nursery schools, what we were doing to very small children, and then just telling you what was going to happen or what she was seeing happen. But we are now living in it, like the full realization of all of it. And remember, nursery school is what they called it then. We call it daycare now. It's really daycare because you're taking these little children who have the capacity to learn at a much higher level than they are learning and we stick them in a place where they play. They play. They don't, they're not with teachers. They're not even in a Montessori situation where there are specific learning areas geared toward exploratory learning and very specific concrete ideas. Nope. Don't even do that. Just go play with everybody. Be nice to everybody. Share your toys. And there's a whole lot of neglect too. Not in every daycare, but lots, lots, lots of neglect. So what happens when they get to elementary school and they double down and they keep doubling down and they keep doubling down? When you read this essay and then you go read John Taylor Gatto and his 30 years of experience and he wrote his book 25 years ago, you, you realize like the people saw it and they talked about it and they warned us. They warned us. Not me because I was a little kid, but I mean, they warned us. We didn't listen. Our grandparents, our parents, and now we as parents are perpetuating this system, the comprachicos of the mind. But we don't have to. And that's what I'm trying to do with this channel and with everything I say and do. I'm trying to tell people you don't have to do this to your children. It's not too late. Unless they're adults, in which case, I don't know. But as long as they're still below 18, you can, you can do something about it. You can try. So that concludes part four. Thank you for listening. I hope you will come back for the last part, part five. I believe it is the last part. And we'll finish this up. And as always, thank you for supporting this channel. There are numerous ways you can support it. You can join my locals. You can contribute to my Patreon, PayPal, um, or just like, comment, and share. It feeds the algorithm and that helps too. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. That's the video.